ever changing situation. Uh, I'm Rachel Phillips Buck. Uh, Matt Boisvert is joining me. Yeah, good afternoon. I know that you are, when we say in uh, amidst the coronavirus, I know that you have a lot happening rapidly on your campus. Um, and so thank you so much for your time right now. We do think it's really important as we are wrestling with the immediate response to our students and their families in the need to engage them and also step back and think about the power of community in the thick of this. How can we leverage um, what you all do really well? So just a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this session. We will send it to you um, with the ability for you to share that with other people. So if there are people on your campus who it would be helpful for them to get this, you'll have access to that. Also, all of the things that I'm talking about, whether they're resources that we have for you or specific steps, we're gonna package up all the Help Center articles, step-by-step -step processes that I'm talking about. So you don't have to feel like you have to um, write down everything that we're saying. We'll make sure that we give you an easy list um, for you to be able to have access to those resources and then also some of the processes we're gonna talk about. So we know this is a really uncertain time with a lot of new things happening. And the other thing that we know without a doubt is that community is really powerful. So today we're going to talk about having a relational response to all the things that are happening, all of these changes. We'll talk about your promise to your students and their families. We'll also talk about our student success funnel and uh, end just going through a lot of the Ferris tools that have already been developed for you to be able to um, address this situation in the best way possible. So let's just talk for a second about relational versus trans transactional responses. Um, if you've spent any time with us, you've heard this from us over and over that there is a transactional response that has to be created. That's kind of how we um, talk about things like logistics and that sort of thing. But what you all do really well is you craft your responses to be relationship oriented. So if we think about the administration what they're focusing on are things like leadership of the institution, logistics of how we keep our students safe and what we do on our campus, policies, um, the financial impact on our students. And so a lot of their communication is going to be transactional because they're trying to give you the information that we need. If you think about academics, their response um, is really focused on how do we deliver academic content? How do we do that online? Here are instructions for Canvas and here are instructions for how we schedule things and how you're going to submit assignments. All of that is coming up from that sort of academic thrust. Um, and then we think about student life and what you guys do is create connections. You make sure that students feel seen. Uh, you run into them in the library and you say, hey, how's it going? I've been thinking. And so that becomes incredibly difficult when our students are not on our campus, when we have to kind of manufacture these spaces to run into students and to see them eye to eye. And so that's really where we want to spend our time today is talking about this relational response in a time where we are disconnected and we're <laughs> quarantined and we're separated from each other and we're not on campus. How do we do community really well? And you all are the people who have kind of that magic essence of what it means to be in community. So before we move on, I want you to think about and maybe jot down one or two reasons why your students on your campus picked to come and be part of your community instead of choosing to do online classes from home. So we know that there's a broad um, group of people um, in the United States who are choosing to do online classes for a lot of reasons. There are some good reasons. Um, but as you think about your community, the people that you can picture, why did they decide to come to your campus to do classes amongst you instead of staying at home with their parents and doing online courses or even getting an apartment and doing online courses. I want you to write down some of those things that come to mind and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Yeah, really what Rachel's talking about is a big part of that is your promise. The words that you use to describe your campus, a lot of it is about community. When you think about the 
your mission, your college's mission, and during the recruiting process, what is said, spoken to incoming students about what their um, what this experience is going to be like. Uh, all of that is a promise that you're making to your students. And when I look at this, is an example straight from one of our schools. Um, admissions webpage, just all the words that were used to describe the experience on their campus. And some really strong ones come out. You can clearly see students, plural, but campus, traditions, um, even, you know, thinking about being equipped. Um, so when you think about if you just made a word cloud to be able to show your administration, this is our promise. This is what we've communicated. And it's really important that in the midst of all of this, we stay focused on delivering that. Absolutely. So, um, so much of the drive in these early days as we're trying to protect our students and our community is how are we going to solve the academic problem? These students are midway through courses. How are we going to deliver, deliver academic content? But it's so important for you all to be able to articulate to your students and on campus, these are the reasons why you picked us. And the truth is, whatever those things are that you wrote down, the reason a student decided to be part of your community instead of taking online classes, that is the value of your institution. And those things have to have a direct line in the way you deliver support to your students in the next eight weeks, even though they're not on your campus. So um, there's a lot to say about the value proposition, but I would just uh, encourage you to think about how your institution does online classes and how are you going to frame that in a way that parents and teachers and support staff can understand because there are institutions all over the United States who are doing online classes. They are not the same as the way you are going to do them because you have this supplement of community and student life coming in. So to be able to articulate that I think is incredibly yeah. important. Okay, um, if you joined us a couple of weeks ago, which seems like a year ago, because things are very different, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the art of community. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this piece. Um, if you don't have this book, I think it's a, a great resource. It breaks down all of the ways that you invite people into community and make sure that they feel strongly connected to you. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of in a broad perspective, I'm happy to send you that webinar that we're doing. But I think these um, seven things, uh, when we think about how to reinforce community with students not on our campus are really good ways for us to sort of organize our thinking. So I'm gonna go through them really quickly. The first one is boundary. Please remember the way that we connect students to us is by saying, hey, you're one of us, you're in. And right now, you want to be communicating in a relational way about the boundary of your campus. You are one of us. We want you. We're going to face this together. Even though we're not in the same place, you and I are part of this group that's going to hold together and overcome this challenge. So communicating that boundary you are in, you are with us, is going to be really important. The next one is an, an initiation, and I think it's really interesting because likely you've had some initiation on your campus. If you've had to send students home, the packing up of their res halls together while they're trying to make sense of um, this pandemic that's coming upon us, that is initiation into our present state. Um, what is difficult about that is oftentimes that initiation, we don't realize that's what's happening until after the fact. And so the right thing to do is then come back and help them process that initiation because the way that they left your campus, the feelings that they had about leaving the community, those will be things that are lasting and um, they won't forget them. They'll be a, a kind of defining part of their experience and you want to use the right language to help them process that in a, a helpful way. And even if they haven't left your campus, if you're still um, in a process of having classes, but, but your sports have been canceled, there's a new initiation for your student athlete into your community in a different way than what they were expecting this spring. Absolutely. Okay, rituals. This is a really difficult one because for so many of our institutions, we can name the rituals that we've been doing for 150 years as we've all been on the same ground and the same place together. And so thinking about how you take 
community displays of commitment and adapt those to um, this new reality will be part of how we reinforce our community and our commitment to our students. And I feel like as the days go by and we learn from each other and um, we create new ideas and this will become a more robust idea, but definitely on your campus, name the rituals that are important. I mean, graduation is uh, at the top of everyone's mind. There's a ritual associated with that graduation. And if you just say, hey, we're not doing that because we're not here, it's, it is distressing to everybody, right? So there really is a huge opportunity in the midst of this to, to craft new rituals that define your community in a, in a new way. Absolutely. Um, the next one is temple. And remember, when we talk about temple, we just talk about the space where we connect with each other and where we um, talk. And so I told Matt this morning, I feel like Zoom is gonna be the new temple or WebEx or whatever it is you are using. That becomes a place that we hold a space so that we can see each other and we can talk about the things that are most important. And so we just have to have a new temple uh, to be able to do those things that we're used to being able to do on campus. But all three of those things are so important. So that practicing of community, the telling of stories and celebrating successes, even in the midst of all of this is really important. Absolutely. It, it kind of uh, lends itself to the next piece, which is telling stories. So I would encourage you to be collecting stories of students who have been well served by the institution, who have nothing but um, gratefulness for the way that you all have served them or taken care of them or supported of them. And you need to tell those stories, not just to other students, but also to other people on your campus. So the power of a story to communicate community and how you will overcome challenges cannot be overstated. Right. And that needs to come where we just, you know, see each other in the hall and we say, hey, did you hear about this student and here's what we did for them. And it also needs to come through emails and through um, connections on the phone where we're saying this is what we're doing. This is how we're supporting each other and it's a, a really powerful tool to reinforce that. Okay, two more as we're thinking about community symbols. So you want to be thinking about tangibles. How do we say to our students, hey, you are with us and every time you hold this thing, remember that you're part of our community. Um, we've been talking a lot uh, at Ferris about the resurgence of writing letters and how for a generation of students that does not come from a place where letters were a thing that you got very often, the unique touch for coaches or RDs or the Dean of Students to write a letter that says, we're sad, we're apart, we're looking forward to August when we can have a celebration that they can hold that in their hand and feel seen and connected will be powerful. Uh, talking to one of our clients about this, he said the power of the written word cannot be underappreciated, that you have a, a huge opportunity to wow your students by just writing a card yeah. and sending them and letting them know that you're thinking about them. For sure. And then the last one I want to talk about is just inner rings. I think this applies to our communities in two different ways as we're trying to make sense of what's happening please remember that you are part of the inner ring of your institution. And so while administration is busy working on the things that they're working on and academics are busy working on the things they are, your voice to guide relational connections with your students is going to be vital um, for the health of your institution. And I also would say, please think about students who have moved into the inner rings for your institution. We think about things like student government, RAs, tutors. Um, those are people who feel connected to your community because they can serve their peers. And we don't want for them to be adrift because we're not asking them to help us connect with students. So I think RAs um, still have jobs that they can do. I think tutors do, student government. We can um, tap into those sources of our inner rings of students to help us deliver what we need to on our campus. And they're going to have such an important voice in the experience and give you new ideas of how to reach students. Yes. 
Um, so that's a summary of the art of community. Um, highly recommend the book. We'll continue to kind of explore this and come up with new ideas for you, but I think it's a great template for how to think about what's happening. And if you weren't able to join us for our last session just on the hunger for community, please email Rachel uh, and she'll be happy to send you a link to that. I think it's also very important right now, I don't know about your campus, but we've heard a lot from our clients about angry parents, students who are frustrated. Um, there's, there's a request for refunds. There is a request for a, an exception for living in the resident hall because they have a, a need that wasn't known. In all of this, there's a huge opportunity for recovery by showing your customers, your students, that you care and you're invested in them. Um, being able to engage your students in a way that wows them, allows you to build a level of loyalty with them that, that even prior didn't exist. Um, you might have had a student who was uncertain if they wanted to come back, but because of the way that you reached out to them and engaged them, they couldn't imagine going anywhere else. So there is a real opportunity through the work that you do to build stronger loyalty with your students. First, first of all, for your students to know that you see them, that you're looking out for them, that you are in spite of the fact that, that they're on an online environment or that their sports have been canceled, that you are um, pursuing them and, and that they're seen is very important. Also, it's very important to say to them, we're invested in your growth and we're going to continue to be invested in your growth. And as Rachel was saying about continuing to use those relationships that have already been established in the fall up to now, being able to leverage those is really important, but also for them to hear, we're not abandoning you. It's very important that they hear that you're with them and still invested in their growth. And finally, as we said, it's just so important for them to hear, we want you, we want to be close to you, we want you to be in the community, um, even though we have a lot of challenges. So I think when we're talking about recovery, it's really interesting. Um, I have said to many of you that I was an at-risk student and Matt and I have been reflecting at this point in our freshman year. So at this point in my freshman year, I was still an at-risk student. I didn't feel connected to community. Probably if I had had to go home, um, I would have been relieved and I probably would not have come back. But as I imagine student development and student life reaching out to me and saying, hey, how's it going? What do you need? How can we be helpful? We can't wait until you come back. That's actually a place where it's highly likely that I would have come back. That would be a recovery for my institution because I feel isolated and they're like, no, you're one of us, which is really powerful. And it's a way that you would take an at-risk student and because of your engagement with them, move them to a deeply committed and loyal student who's going to be able to be successful at your institution. Um, I, I hate to talk about this piece because it is very um, difficult for those of us who are investing so much time and so many resources in retention. And when I say retention, I mean the outcome for our students. We know that student success is the way that we improve retention. Um, we have a lot of challenges to face as we're thinking about how we help our students uh, be successful and how we help our institutions be successful. If you watched our quick hits video, I mean, just the fact that you have eight weeks fewer face to face time with your students is going to impact retention. If we believe the way we increase retention is we look at our students and we have meetings with them and we engage with them. They're not on your campus. That's going to make an impact on retention. Also, you don't have as much information about students, so you're not able to run into them on the hall in the hall. You're not able to observe their behavior. They are separated from you. And so the fact that you don't have sort of observations of their behavior is going to make it difficult to identify students who are struggling. Um, another piece that's kind of unprecedented for our institutions is that modeling is not as relevant for identifying at-risk students. So there's demographic information about students who have low high school GPAs and they haven't transferred in any hours, which would make them susceptible to 
um, struggle. This is a completely different thing that has broken all of the models. And so we can't just pre-identify students by looking at data. We have to pay attention to some other um, important pieces uh, in, the, in the process. Um, I would also say it's difficult to identify students who are struggling because we've um, done something that's kind of breaking the barrier of the unknown. So you have groups of students who maybe did not take online classes because they thought, well, I don't know how to do that and I don't know if I'd be successful in that. I don't know if my parents would love that. Um, you have students who are continuing in on your um, programs and your institution because they can't imagine what it would be like if they stopped going to your institution, what that would look like. But we've now broken all of those barriers. Students are now experiencing online classes it's going to be easier for them to know if they can be successful. They're going to be able to imagine a life where they don't go to school at your institution. Parents are going to experience students being invested in online classes and all of those things make it easier than for students to make a choice other than to come back to your institution. So it's very similar. If you think about transfer students, we always say if you have transferred once, then you're more likely to do it more often because you've navigated that process and you understand you don't have this barrier. So it's going to be really difficult for us to um, overcome this sort of new normal that students are experiencing unless we give them a good reason to stay connected to us. The last thing that I would say about this identifying students who are struggling and trying to make sense of what's going to happen with retention is you need to have a short term and a long term um, perspective on this. So when we think about the short term, if you're on a semester or if you're on um, what's the other one quarter. quarter a quarter term, those are going to be the places where you say, how are we going to help this student for that short amount of time be successful in their classes and feel like they're being supported to, with us as they're making sense of what's happening to them. But then you have a longer range plan, which is after this is semester, this semester is over and they're moving into the summer, how do we keep them close to us so that they will come back um, in August? And Matt, you were talking about under-enrolled, right? That that's even a new sort of at-risk factor for students. That previously when we had students who were not enrolled, we knew that they were at risk. But now, even students who are enrolling for their next semester, it doesn't mean that between now and six months from now, things won't change That's where right. they don't come back. I think it's really important to just think about this as a, a huge disruption to higher education. And in that is, is a real opportunity by emphasizing the value of community. A lot of times um, it's, it is, as we said, you know, talked about in admissions, but for you right now, by being intentional in this crisis of highlighting and bringing out the power of community and how transformative student development can be, there's a lot of opportunity for you in making a distinction between your campus and other campuses that did not invest in uh, your students the way that we're talking about. As I said, all of that comes back to just the value of your promise and being able to show you are able to deliver on that um, even in the midst of the coronavirus. Absolutely. So thinking about how we're going to put that retention puzzle together, there's lots of moving pieces. There are lots of elements. Um, we will be thinking about how to help our schools with that equation, both of inputs, which are going to be um, difficult because of the fact that you can't do admissions um, gatherings. And so inputs are going to be difficult. Uh, what you're doing on your campus is going to be part of that equation and then outcomes as well. So we will keep thinking about that retention puzzle together. I want to move on now to some really specific things that you can do. Um, you know that we are always talking about our student success funnel. How do we find students who are struggling? How do we make sure that they're connected? How do we solve our problems, uh, the problems that they have? And then how do we look at the outcomes that are coming um, from that process? So I want to move into identify. Um, you guys, I think this is going to be one of the trickiest parts of the funnel for institutions. Um, 
before we could look at data, we could do pre-identified cohorts. We're looking at a leading indicator. So if a student is first generation and they're not transferring in hours and they have a certain GPA, this is a group of students we can really easily identify as likely to need extra support. Now, all of a sudden, we are talking about behavioral um, issues and issues that we normally would solve on our campus, things like technology or internet, that we cannot solve because they're not with us. So a couple of tools that we've created for you. The first is the 2020 Student Impact Survey. This was created with um, our good friend, Dr. Woosley, who is a genius about research and surveys. She's been doing it for 25 years. You might know her from MapWorks, mm -hmm. if you've used MapWorks in the past. But we've been working since last week to develop a survey that's gonna help us both sort of guide our students in the challenges that they're facing and get us information about students who are at risk and who are really struggling. And as your students take this, we're gonna be providing aggregate data and individual data to be able to say, these are the trends that we're seeing. This is what students are telling us. So the two pieces of that survey are, first of all, we wanna give them questions that are gonna help them reflect on what's happening and um, sort of verbalize some of the solutions that they have. So things like, what is the hardest thing for you about not being with your campus community? Um, where will you be taking your online courses? Please name somebody who's gonna be a great resource to you. Those will be some of the questions that are gonna help them reflect on those. And then the other piece is that we're gonna be gathering information for you guys to be able to identify resources and support needs so that you can create cohorts of students who, these are all of the students who um, accessibility services needs to know about, or these are all of the students who were anticipating getting tutoring this semester, and now we have to figure out how to provide for that. So uh, the elements of those surveys are online classes, where are you gonna be taking those, resource concerns, service concerns, support concerns. Um, it'll be really easy for them to take that survey. They'll just get an email with a link in it. And then if you have already been serving your students, you can deploy this survey anytime you want. So if you want to wait three weeks and then come back to revisit, hey, how's it going? What's been difficult? What's been easier for you? You can do that as well uh, anytime that it makes sense. Um, it's really easy for you to get access to that survey. So we will send you the way to sign up for it. You can scan this uh, code as well, but that is actually gonna be integrated into Ferris 360 so that you will be able to do data reporting and get the right information to this touch point relationship so that they're very clear on the groups of students that they need to be managing. Okay. Some other um, ways that you're gonna be looking to identify students who are struggling, if you did a non-cognitive um, survey at any point, this is gonna be a, a gold mine for you. Could be a really great tool. So if you think about a, if the transition survey, um, if you're, so that's the Benchworks transition new student assessment. There's two ways to look at your non-cognitive data. One is, you have a group of students based on that data who in the past you would have identified as at risk and now we know that they're more at risk. The other side is you had students who were integrating really well or they were not showing any signs of, of concern, um, but you can see here the difference in yellow and green. So if they had a low commitment to the institution before, you can expect that they have a lower institution uh, commitment to the institution today. If they had a low intent to return in the fall before, it's even lower today. If they indicated they were not missing their family back home at all. <laughs> You've just sent them back to their and family. And you sent them <laughs> back to their family, they might be a risk. In the same way, if they were really thrilled with their on-campus living environment, and now that's taken, they're moved off campus, then they would be considered at risk. You can see uh, analytical skills. If there was a tutoring process that you had that was very effective, for instance, for students who had a low SAT math and um, how, how will you provide that tutoring service to them? Answering that question is very important. You can also see just questions about how they manage their time or how they organize their day. If they're scoring, scored low in those, it's going to be really overwhelming for them to have strength in that now moving to an online 
And then also you can see, you know, just the social integration, if they were loving it, and now that's taken away from them. So the power of community you can see in this non-cognitive. So if you think there about students who are really belonging, they're really invested, they want to hear more about student engagement, that would be a great indicator if they were still on campus. But then once we take them out of that element, it becomes a risk factor. And so if you're, if you're using Thriving or the CSI, there's similar um, questions that you can go and mine for that. Just looking for that difference between students who were already at risk and students who in the past um, were showing signs of being really strong on your campus. It's really important for you to notice that. So I think just to reiterate, your most at, stu at risk students are most at risk. Um, this is a secondary element that we're adding uh, to those risk factors. But now we want to be looking at how your least at risk students are now at risk. And so we typically work with our schools on st students who have not yet registered compared to students who have registered and even breaking that down by resident hall. And it, in the past, it was great because RAs could go and have a conversation about, hey, you haven't registered yet, and gather that information about why. Oh, I'm just waiting. I need to talk to my mom about this, or I'm waiting some for my financial aid to load. Um, and, and now we don't have that ability to have easily that engagement to understand, oh, this isn't a, an at-risk student. This is actually a student who just has uh, a timing. They haven't registered yet. Okay, some other ways that you're gonna identify students who are struggling. We talked um, last week about giving them a self-referral process. So being able to go um, give them a quick link where they can go in and do a self-referral and they can say, these are the things that I'm struggling with. Remember that we're um, kind of tapping our students for that information in the same way we would be our faculty. So for a faculty, they can send in a referral, but then we have these strategic times where we're like, hey, go in and tell us this information with our surveys. Same thing with students. We want to send out a survey and say, this is a time where we're asking you to tell us about what's happening. And then as the weeks go by, we need to give them the opportunity when they're feeling overwhelmed or a need has a, arisen that they want to ask help for, um, this is a good way for them to go in and ask for help. And so we've built that into 360. Um, we can turn that on for you so that you have a quick and easy process to allow students to do self-referrals about what's happening. And as always, that's editable, but we kind of push out for you our best practice. The other way that you'll identify students who need some extra support is by thinking about anchoring groups. So this is a really tricky one because we've said for a long time, just know where a student is anchored. Is that in athletics? Is that in their major? Is that with a um, organization or a club? And if you know that they're anchored there, then you're gonna be really happy to allow that group to take care of them. Well, now what we're saying is that students who have a group where they are anchored are actually going to feel the loss of that more significantly. So if I have a bunch of people I'm spending time with all the time and then I'm not on campus anymore, that is going to be a distressing experience for me. And so you want to think about majors like nursing or um, theater or music where they're with each other all the time. We, we have been talking a lot about extroverts, right? That extroverts are gonna have an especially difficult time not having space to be with other people. And so the goal is to identify those anchored groups and then provide and facilitate communication and ways to be together even as we're not on campus together. Okay, so identification models aren't going to work. There's some data in terms of non-cognitive that we can look at, but really we've got to ask our students what's happening with them through surveys, give them an ability to identify themselves, and then also support the work of anchored groups who are going to be really bereft of not being able to spend time with each other. Connect is the next piece. Once you've identified those students who are struggling, we wanna make sure that you have a way to connect with them. So remember that we're providing for you those touch point relationships. You can go into 360 and see who are the people who are already connected um, to your students. Those are people who should be doing outreach to them, letter writing, um, that sort of thing. It's really important to communicate to all of those um, professionals. This is a place where we pursue our students hard. 
where we don't give them space, where we're not kind of waiting to see if they're going to do a self referral, referral, but we're actually pursuing them to make sure that they understand that we're seen, that they're seen and that we want to be connected to them. The ways that you do that, as I've been talking about creating space, there's really three different opportunities and we're thinking about um, being able to use video uh, to connect with each other. The first is one on one space. The second one is group space. And then the third one, we're just calling same time, same space. Um, so here are some examples of each of those. One on one is the equivalent of a student has made an appointment to meet to meet with me. They're coming in, they're sitting across from me and we're talking about something really specific. So whatever video conferencing you're using, please use your camera. Please look your students in the eye and relate to them face to face. It's so important for them to have that connection. And I think it's important to say students may not love this, so they may be resistant of um, looking you in the eye and having a meeting this way. But once you do it, it will transform the way that you have those meetings. Show your face and make sure that they see you can see them. Also, we would encourage you to hold office hours. So they're like student life office hours. This is when you're sitting in your office and a student walks by and is like, hey, can I talk to you about something? Absolutely. So we want to replicate that using um, something like Zoom where you say, hey guys, I just want you to know every day from one to three, I'm in a Zoom meeting and here's the link and I would love for you to come and join me. That may be a one on one conversation. You may have another student drop in and then we're facilitating community in the same way you would if you were meeting with a student and some other people dropped in uh, to talk to you. And then the other really important thing is you have a lot of RAs who um, have the capacity to have one on one meetings with students. And so I'm going to talk more about that. I'm going to give you some forms to be able to facilitate that. But it's a great idea to have RAs doing check ins face to face one on one with their students. Okay, the next way that you're going to connect with your students is scheduled group time. So if you think about deploying group tutoring, we're going to have this meeting open and anybody who needs tutoring for the subject can drop in. We have our tutor there. We're going to have conversation. Everybody's going to be showing their um, camera and we can use some of those tools to be able to deploy tutoring. Um, Matt was talking about club meetings and major meetings. So if that is an anchoring group, you want to have space for all of those people to be able to come in and connect and see each other in a scheduled way, just like they would do on campus. For them to be able to see the dean of their program um, there and talking to them, bringing them together, that's really powerful. When I think about my experience, my alma mater as a part of a social group and um, the idea of not being connected with my peers that way, and so for those club advisors to be thinking about ways of facilitating this group time is very important. You could do this for your hall meetings as well. So if you have RDs that are doing nightly hall meetings, um, this would be scheduled group time. And then just any organization, we want to create space like we would do in a normal semester for those groups to come together to see each other um, and to talk about what's happening. And then the last one that I want to encourage you about is this idea of um, same time, same space. So if you think about recreating community gatherings where everybody on your campus would come together, if you have chapel or if you have a weekly meeting or if you have um, any, any time where the entire community is coming together and sort of reaffirming their commitment to each other, this is a great thing to have online. Um, there's uh, some power in being able to see those things continuing to take place as we think about um, facilitating connections and making sure that everybody is reminded of the community. Um, also, we have a lot of schools that are using same time, same space just to do administrative tasks together or having open meetings to be together. The best way to explain this is if you think about on a campus in the library where you have a group of five or six students that are studying together, they maybe are not talking together or they don't have a lot of conversation. They're all doing their same thing. But in this case, they're joining a Zoom meeting. So they're in the same space in the same time together so that if they wanted to have a side conversation or they wanted to ask a question or tell a funny story, they would be able to do that even though they're not all working on the same thing together. So thinking through how we open up same time, same space to reinforce community is going to be a really powerful uh, tool as well. Really thinking about how do you facilitate 
um, connections using Zoom, using emails, using text messages, using written letters. Um, how do we find a place for us all to be together, whether very intentional, like advising or tutoring, or just I miss my friends and I want to be in a place where yeah. we can connect? A lot of our clients um, already do a great job on the athletic side where coaches are engaged with their students in really unique ways. Um, they're really gifted at building community and reinforcing community. When you think about your uh, coaches, they're probably still involved in an online way of recruiting uh, student athletes for next year. Um, but there are no practices, there are no games. They might be posting on social media often, and that's a way that they've been connected uh, to the, with their students and prospects. But um, there's other ways to leverage that relationship. If you haven't talked to athletics, just to hear the ways that they're doing that right now or to encourage them in other uh, ways of engaging their students, ways of holding their student athletes accountable, ways of mentoring their student athletes. Um, we, as I said, just talking to one of our, our uh, friends and, and he was talking about that power of the written word, uh, using that should be a model for your campus on who are the other parts of our community, maybe it's advisors, even financial aid officers, people who are um, counselors, to be able to engage students in the ways that student athletics has learned and been successful and are right now adapting uh, so that they can continue to recruit a great class for next year. A lot can be learned about that and also um, great ways to deliver that. Yeah, and I love that idea of mentoring, right? As we're talking about continuing to help students grow, that this is not just a, hey, how, how, how's it going? But like, we are in the middle of good work and we wanna continue that with you as you grow and, and get mentored. Um, we've built into your 360 system Res Life Connection Report. So if you're interested in having either RAs or, or RDs check in with your students about what's happening with them, um, we've built in things like this is the kind of engagement and remember every time we're building forms we're trying to teach um, the people who are going to be using the forms good ways to do what they're doing so in this way we're like look these are all of the ways that you could have a connection with your student I want you to think about the level of connection that you have is this just kind of an off-the-cuff conversation or is this a really deep conversation make sure that you're asking them about things like how are you adjusting to your online classes what's going on with your living situation do you have technology problems giving them the list of things to go through and address with their residents because we're trying to facilitate that community can be really powerful so we've built this student update into your site it should be live for you sometime this afternoon Again, you can always go in and edit. So if you want to add new things or you'd like um, to have other questions, you can totally do that. But this is a really easy way to teach RAs the kinds of um, questions and issues you want to be assessing given what's happening on our campuses now. Also tutors. So if you are going to do online tutoring, I would encourage you to use our tutoring report. Um, you can tweak this so that it's more relational. So maybe we have students uh, in a meeting because we're talking about tutoring and we're doing group tutoring, but then you could add questions to this report about what are the other challenges, what's the most difficult thing. That will also be built into your system for you to use, or if you have a different one that you love, you can use that really quickly. The last one that I want to talk about in the system, so so many of you are using outstanding students. I love this idea of community, community encouragement in our student updates, so we'll turn this one on for you as well. This can be routed directly to your student. So as you think about what is an easy way for our professionals to say to a student, you know, I was thinking about you today and I'm, I'm sorry that we can't have a face-to-face -face meeting like normal, or I was wondering how your classes are going, or whatever that, just dropping a note to say, you're on my mind, I want you, I see you, we're in this together. That's a really easy way to do that. And faculty and staff like can go in and um, create those community encouragements to go directly to students. So how do we use Zoom as the new temple? How do we open up space to be with each other and to communicate really clearly how important it is that we are connected apart from academics? Um, I'm, and apart from administration, but because we like each other and we're in community with each other, really that's what we're trying to um, talk about there. 
Okay, let's move on to solve. So you guys, solve I think is the most um, quickly changing, oh my goodness, I didn't think of that problem place for our schools. Um, so when you think about students who have a problem because we have advising, advising should be open now, we're losing time, how are we gonna deliver that? When you think about the financial needs, both because they want their money back or because they can't do work study anymore, which means they can't pay for their schooling, um, or because they've dropped a class and now they're below their loan uh, requirement. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, when you think about graduation, so the graduation office and seniors who would be applying and how are we gonna make that happen? And then also the ritual of gradu graduation, things like tutoring, things like technology. These are all problems that are brand new that every institution is having to grapple with and that depending on your resources and the way you're connected with students, you are gonna have different solutions to that. And so please hear me say that we are really committed to gathering those practices as we learn from you and we learn from each other and we do research about the best ways to solve those problems we will be pushing those out to you. Look, this is how we think you could solve graduation. This is how we think that you can solve financial aid um, concerns. We are like in the input and learning phase of how we're gonna solve these different problems. I would say it is really helpful to make a distinction between the things that you can solve, things like advising and graduation, and the things that you can be supportive of, but that you are going to help students solve this by teaching the process of relying on other resources. So when you think about childcare or internet or computer needs, I've seen so many of you posting um, links to internet uh, providers who are like, hey, we're gonna give away internet free for six, 60 days so that your students can use that. If your students are home and they have food insecurity or it's not a great living situation, that maybe is something that you can support them with, but there are other resources in their town that will be able to provide help for them. And so there are things we can solve and then there are ways that we are gonna teach these students how to be self-directed and have self-agency and find resources that maybe are not coming from your institution. Okay, so the very last thing that I want to cover, and if you guys have any questions, please chat those. We'll have some time left over at the end and I'm happy to schedule more time with you to talk about specifics on your campus. But I want you to know, you got an email from me last week where we pushed out to you the COVID-19 emergency response student um, update. That was created to help you keep track of symptoms and absence absences of your students and to track where they're coming from if they're coming back from spring break so that you have an idea of how um, high a level of country alert that they're coming back from. If you are interested in that student impact survey, it's free, it's really simple. We've done a lot of really good thinking for you. And so I will show you that link and we will send that email to you. That you have to sign up for so that we can turn it on so you can press it out to your students, but it's ready to go. So we'd love to be able to share that with you. And then by this afternoon, you will have four student updates, a connection report for your RAs to be able to use, a student self-referral so that you can provide an opportunity for students in the coming weeks to tell you about ways that they're struggling. We'll give you a tutoring report that will have some relational questions as well as just capturing what happened in the meeting um, around specific subject tutoring. And then also we will push to you the student update um, that's called community encouragement that will be routed directly to your students. So if someone on your campus fills that out, they will really easily be able to get that um, and see, hey, we're missing you, we're seeing you. I would say as you're thinking about using Ferris 360 to support all of these processes, remember um, you can use tools like case status and case type to help you keep track of where you are with students. And if you do not have case type, so that is a brand new thing that we're um, pushing out to clients. If you don't have case type, that kind of secondary tag, please let me know and we'll get that turned on to, for you but you would be able to do process management and case status. Here's, we've invited them to our res hall Zoom meeting. 
And then also case type, here's the specific need or requirement that they are um, identifying for us. So that will be a really helpful tool in that case management. And then also please remember that as you are from your survey or in some other way identifying cohorts of students, here are all of the students who said that they wanted tutoring this semester and we've got to figure out how to deliver it to them. Things like uploading those co cohorts into 360 and then assigning them and keeping track of them. We've got a lot of good Help Center articles to help you do that and we'll package that up into the email that we're sending you. And then finally, I would say um, the last piece is your ability to go in and measure. So both from your survey responses, from the cohorts that you're opening, um, all of the work that you're doing to be able to have the resolution. Here, all of the students we identified is at risk. Here's how much contact we had with them. So here's kind of the emails and the time that we spent with them. Being able to tell that story of success for your community and student development and student life is going to be really powerful at the end of this kind of whirlwind of work that you guys are doing. I hope this has been helpful uh, to give you some ideas of bringing your community together. We clearly, I hope you can see, we're really invested in your success and we believe in the transformative power of student development. Through this process, um, you have a lot of strengths that your overall institution can really learn from. Um, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. And as Rachel said, um, if you're interested if you're a Ferris 360 client and you're interested in, in using the student impact survey, uh, complete this form. If you're interested in, in learning more and you're not a 360 client, please complete the form and, and we'll provide that to you. And you should have gotten a direct link from chat. So if you wanna click on that, that will take you directly to that place. And then if you have any questions that I can help you with, please contact me directly. Um, I'm really happy to spend time thinking through how we can help you find students who are struggling, make sure they feel connected to your community, and then solve those problems that are coming up. So I'm happy to hear from you um, if you need help. I'll stick around for a little bit. If you have questions, please stay on. Otherwise, you guys, thank you so much. Please know that we are working hard to be good partners to you and provide thought leadership um, as we move forward. Have a great day.